Okay, hi. And today um, we're going to kind of finish up our unit on graph algorithms. And if you remember from last class, we're talking about hard graph problems. And last class we introduced this new problem of vertex cover. So I just wanted to kind of wrap this up and remind us what are the differences between these two problems of matchings and vertex cover because they're closely related but also have important differences. So matching, um, remember this is we're trying to pair up vertices in a way that the pairs don't overlap. So what's inside of matching is actually edges, like the pairs that we choose. Um, and the goal with matching is to get as many as possible. Uh, so the goal is we want to get more edges in our matching, but of course they can't overlap. And we have an approximation. We can use any greedy strategy, and it'll be at most um, one half Sorry, it'll be at least uh, any greedy strategy will produce a matching, which is at least um, half the size of the optimal maximum match matching. And we can also actually find compute the optimal maximal matching with a more complicated algorithm, uh, which is Edmonds uh, Blossom algorithm, which was big O of n to the four. OK, so. For the case of matching, we can solve the problem perfectly, but it's kind of an expensive algorithm, although it's feasible, it's polynomial time. Um, but we can also get a pretty good approximation with the greedy strategy to find a maximal matching. And that's what that problem is about. A vertex cover, on the other hand, is where we want to pick vertices that cover the edges. So you have to pick vertices that um, touch every edge. And so what's inside a vertex cover is vertices. And the goal is to have minimum vertex cover. You can always trivial, trivially get uh, a large vertex cover by just like picking all of the vertices. But we want to try to um, have a covering that's as small as possible. This one we can also approximate. Um, and the cool thing here, the connection, is that we can approximate with any, we pick both um, endpoints from any maximal matching. So any like greedy or maximal matching will give us a 0.5 approximation to the largest maximal matching, but will also give us a uh, at most two times approximation to the smallest vertex cover. So that's, that's the, the main connection between them. And then the main difference between them, I would say, is that we don't know any way of um, getting the optimal solution other than uh, like a brute force search, exponential search, like of trying all the possible sets of vertices. OK, so now let's move on to a new problem, which is the traveling salesman problem. Very, very famous problem. It's the last big problem we're going to talk about in this unit. And it's going to lead us into the next unit on NP completeness. And um, it has a lot of applications. So here's the formal definition. It's the shortest cycle that includes every vertex exactly once, or um, you know, an indication that no such cycle exists. So just remember, what is a cycle? Is a path that starts and ends at the same vertex. So like a closed loop um, in the graph, and includes every vertex exactly once. That's that's really the big challenge here. So. Um, we have to find a cycle that goes everywhere, but not more than once. Um, and so this actually, this has a name in and of itself. Um, so this a cycle that includes every vertex exactly once is called a uh, Hamiltonian cycle. Hamiltonian cycle does not come from Alexander Hamilton, um, but actually comes from an Irish mathematician and physicist. So there's a, there's a lot of applications to this problem. Um, some that are very important in modern times, such as like UPS deliveries. So that's that's a really important one that comes up right now. So what is what is the UPS delivery problem? Is I have the UPS facility, that's where the trucks are, and then I have a whole bunch of places where they're supposed to go, um, and it takes some amount of time to drive between all those locations. So you want to say what's the optimal route for that UPS truck to take? that'll be able to go through all its deliveries and make it back to the, to the depot at the end of the day. Um, and of course, I would like it to be shortest. So you could 
there's always a way that you can drive everywhere you need to drive, but what's the shortest way to go between them? Um, and of course, you don't want to like repeat yourself. You just want to go to every place exactly once. Um, there's there's other kinds of applications, but I think those kind of planning problems where you need to visit things uh, that that's really the main application of this. And that's that's kind of what the name is evocative of as well, right? The traveling salesman that wants to go sell stuff. Um, uh, of course, it's it's also the fact that we're saying salesman indicates the time that this came from. I think when there were people selling stuff a lot door to door, and when we assumed that they would all be men. Um, but anyway, that's the that's the name of it. Also called TSP. Okay, and the, and the challenge that we're gonna look at here is that this is a really hard problem. So that's what this whole part of the unit is about is hard graph problems that we don't have any great ways to solve them. And the thing that we wanna answer is how can we deal with a problem that actually is really hard to solve where we don't have any great algorithms to do it? How can we deal with it anyway? So the first thing we wanna think about is how bad could it be and, and what kind of, how does this relate to other problems? And so there's an important connection, just like there was a connection between matchings and vertex cover, there's an important connection between minimum spanning trees, that's MST, and uh, the traveling salesman problem. So here's an example graph. We're gonna use this a bunch to think about um, some of these uh, TSP results. So we want to think about what's a minimum spanning tree in this graph. And so the dotted edges I'm saying are like edges that don't exist or which are, or which are like impossibly long. And uh, so what is a minimum spanning tree? We can use like Prim's algorithm or Kruskal's algorithm. And what you'll see either way is that the minimum spanning tree ends up being something like this. We could also have chosen this other two edge here. So the minimum spanning tree has size uh, four plus four plus two plus two. So that's 12. And uh, traveling salesman tour. So we wanna think about what's the smallest way to visit all the nodes exactly once, um, if in smallest in terms of adding up all the edge weights. And this would be a good time to pause and see if you can answer that question yourself on this small graph. And now that you've given that a shot, you have probably figured out that turns out the smallest way looks like this. Nope, I screwed it up. Like, there we go. Or the equivalent, like, flip the other way. So the smallest tra traveling salesman tour in this graph um, has size 5 plus 5 plus 4 plus 2 plus 2, which is 18. So what's the relationship here is that if I were to take away any edge of the traveling salesman tour that I found, so if I were to wipe out like um, any one of these edges, let's say the heaviest one, so I take out that five edge, what I have left is I have a path, so it's, it's no longer a, a cycle, but it's just a path, it's going to touch every node exactly once, and it's going to have n minus 1 edges. So if I remove that edge, so I remove an edge, and what I have is a path that touches every vertex once. That's a, that's a special kind of a tree, right? So a tree, remember, is a any um, connected graph that doesn't have any cycles. So that's actually a spanning tree of the graph. If I considered... Um, so I'll draw kind of squiggly. This is the remaining path that I get. That's actually a special spanning tree. And in this case, that spanning tree has size 5 plus 4 plus 2 plus 2, which is uh, 13. And so that's why we have this theorem is that the any traveling salesman tour is going to be at least the size of a minimum spanning tree. So the minimum spanning tree solution gives a lower bound on any traveling salesman problem because this traveling salesman tour has to include a spanning tree, not necessarily the minimum one. So like here's a non-minimal spanning tree, but it has to include some spanning tree plus one more edge. So it current, certainly can't have a length that's smaller than that minimum spanning tree. So that gives us a, a first rough bound and an idea of a connection. And we'll see how this connection can come back later 
in some certain cases to help us actually solve the traveling salesman problem. Um, okay, so the, that, that lower bound itself is actually also useful in this technique called branch and bound. And we're not gonna have time to go into the, um, to get really good at this idea. So if it's something that intrigues you, I encourage you to check it out further yourself. Um, I think that this, this idea would also come up typically in like an algorithms class, which I think is SI 420. Um, but for this particular problem, how would we compute the optimal traveling salesman problem is the idea is that we're gonna explore everything. So exploring everything means that's an exponential search, right? Very slow. Um, but then we are able to cut off some um, parts of that search by quickly estimating how bad is the rest of the problem. And so you're going to cut off the search early in uh, bad like roots of exploration. So what this is saying is, so the branch and bound idea is usually compute like one solution and then you try to compute every other possible solution. But once you know that the one you're working on is de definitely gonna be worse than the one you have already, then you just stop exploring it. So it's, it's not really uh, anything that's gonna be, um, in the worst case, probably better than the, uh, in, in most cases, it's not gonna be better than the worst case exponential time. Um, but it's going to be much better in practice, and it depends on the, your ability to have a quick, dirty kind of lower bound to say, hey, I've taken these three paths, right? So like in this example problem, maybe if I did this long path from A to D, and then this one down here, and then another, you know, then you'd be able to say, well, based on how bad this has gone so far, and based on the size of the minimum spanning tree and the rest of the graph, I know that anything I'm gonna come up with is gonna have size at least 20. And if you already know about one solution that has size 18, then you can say, all right, I'm gonna stop exploring along this route. I don't even have to keep going with all the remaining possibilities because I know that what I have so far is, is always only gonna to lead to something worse um, than the best one that I found so far. Um, okay, so another approach, other than trying to like perfectly solve the problem in every case, and you have to do maybe some complicated branch and bound strategy, is you think about some special cases. Special cases means like restrictions on the graph. So maybe we say, hey, I don't know how to solve perfectly the traveling salesman problem on every graph, but it turns out a lot of the graphs that we might um, deal with in practice are have these certain properties. So one is called the metric traveling salesman problem. And this, uh, so this word metric means that it has to do with the relationship between like, could this be a realistic graph in space? And um, there's something called the triangle inequality. So I'll show you what that means. If I have three points in a graph, it is perfectly acceptable in terms of nodes in the graph to say that the edge weights here are like um, 100 and two and seven. Right? because I can have any edge weights that I want. And certainly for a lot of things, if we're thinking about like network latencies or something else, then this could definitely happen. But if we're thinking about uh, embedding this in like a real space, like these are points um, that you can drive, walk between or something, then this doesn't make sense. So this, this violates the triangle inequality because what you can think about is like, there's no way to draw a triangle that has these three side lengths. The one of length 100 would actually be um, like really long and then you would have this like length seven edge and this length two edge and there's just like no way to actually connect them. So the triangle inequality means kind of, is it possible to draw that as a triangle? And if a graph is a metric graph, then all th any pair of three vertices um, ha obeys this triangle inequality. So what this kind of means, and, and we'll see how this is helpful in a second, is that the shortcuts help. Or I should say that the shortcuts don't necessarily hurt. So what's important about this and the property that we're gonna use in a second is if I call these nodes A, B, and C, the shortcut from A, like so we have a, a way to get from A to C, which is A, B, and then B, C. That has length nine. 
But there's a shortcut, which was you could, we could go directly from A to C. But what's weird about this thing, and again, this does not violate, uh, this does uh, violate the triangle inequality, is that that shortcut from A to C is longer than kind of the long way. Um, and again, if we're talking about like walking places on Earth, that kind of doesn't doesn't make sense and would never be possible to happen. Um, so if we don't have that assumption, then it, it means something important about us solving uh, traveling salesman problem a little bit faster. And an even an, an even more extreme example is what's called Euclidean TSP, is is where you know the um, the nodes are really like two dimensional um, coordinates. And so these are both like restrictions. But what we're essentially saying is, all right, I'm going to assume that there's nothing like this weird picture here that ever exists at any part in the graph. And under that assumption, maybe I can solve the problem a little bit better or a little bit faster. And the way that we can do that is what I think is a really cool idea, and it actually is used in practice, is we can turn any minimum sales, uh, sorry, minimum spanning tree into a TSP tour. So let's go back and remember the minimum spanning tree in this graph looks like this. Okay, so we're gonna start with that. And what we do is we double all the edges in the minimum spanning tree. Because the problem is that with the normal minimum spanning tree, it's not a cycle, right? A, a minimum spanning tree is a, is a tree, it can't have any cycles. So what we do is we double every MST edge. Now we have a cycle because, for example, we could go, um, we could think about going like A, C, E, C, then B, D, and B, C, and back to A. So this is like a cycle that we have and it's just from, um, and you can you can actually do this with something that's called the right hand rule, but going through, starting from A, so we're starting from A, then we go to C, we follow this edge down to E, then we follow the other side back up to C, then we follow this way um, over to B, follow this way to D, then go back, then go all the way back to A. So we've hit every one of these um, edges exactly once, and we have a cycle that starts and ends at A. But the problem is that we remember the traveling salesman problem. We have to hit every node once, and every ed, uh, and every edge can't be duplicated. So it, it has to be a, a cycle through the graph that only goes to every node exactly once. And here I have visited C like four times um, and visited B a couple times. So it's not um, a Hamiltonian cycle. So the problem is we have duplicate nodes. And so the second part of this approximation algorithm is that you just take shortcuts to avoid the repeats. So what's that going to mean is I start at the same spot, and then I'm just going to actually follow this same path, but I'm just going to skip any repeats. So I'll go from A to C, then E is next. I haven't been to E yet, so great, I'll go to E. Then that's supposed to go back to C, but I skip that. So I skip C. Then B would be next. I haven't been there yet, so that sounds good. Then D would be next. I haven't been there yet, so that sounds good. Now B again, but I've already been to B. C again, but I've already been to C. And then I go back to A to complete the cycle. So I'm just putting that in parentheses to emphasize that it's not really a duplicate. It's just closing the loop. And so what does this path look like? Okay, so that one that we came up with is not a, probably the smallest traveling salesman tour, but it is a valid traveling salesman tour. And in this case, it's clearly not optimal. We, we do this silly thing of like crossing over itself um, in order to get back there. But the important thing is, again, going back to this feature of like, sometimes we can't solve a problem exactly, but we can approximate it. How good is this approximation? Well, remember, we already proved that any TSP uh, solution, so any Hamiltonian cycle has to have a larger weight than the minimum spanning tree. Because if you remove an edge from a, any TSP solution, it's going to give you a spanning tree that's not necessarily minimal. And this one, well, what's the total weight of it? We started by duplicating every edge in the minimum spanning tree. And so the total weight, and, and then we took these shortcuts, which we said because it's metric, the shortcuts only help. 
right? So the shortcuts that we took to go from step one to step two are only allowed to make it shorter. So what that means is that we have at most a two times approximation because we know that the optimal solution is certainly um, bigger than the minimum spanning tree. And the solution that we have is less than or equal to two times the minimum spanning tree. And so that means that the solution we have is less than or equal to two times the optimum one. So in this case, for this small graph, it looks pretty bad, this blue approximate solution that we got. Um, but in general, for a very large problem, actually this two times um, solution is, is maybe pretty good. And this is one real method that is used to solve um, traveling salesman problems on really large graphs um, that have to cover a lot of area, as long as they obey this like triangle inequality um, that the shortcuts are always going to help you or at least not hurt. And then finally, the last um, thing that we can think about is how to uh, take a greedy solution. Um, and so two good greedy strategies that I'll, I'll briefly just say what they are. Um, one is the nearest neighbor. So like if I start from A, I can say which what's closest. Okay, so C is closest. And what's closest to C is B or D. And just to make this B bad, um, because the greedy strategy isn't like looking ahead, it's just greedily taking the next best option. So it might pick D. Now you can see that it's gonna get kind of stuck. So um, the nearest neighbor to D is gonna be B. And now B is kind of stuck. There's only one more place for it to go. So it has to take this super long edge out to E and then um, go back up to A. So it gives us a valid tour, but as with most greedy strategies, it's not always gonna be optimum. Um, another strategy is to pick the smallest good edge where good means like um, is it's not going to uh, prevent us from connecting everything together with a with a complete cycle so we might pick this edge first from B to D and then what should we pick next is either one of these edges um, either one of these other twos so that looks good and now we pick a four again we just want to pick one that's um, not going to cause any like early cycles and in this case either one would be allowable um, and so again I'll show the badness of the greedy strategy by picking the one which ends up being worse uh, and then what we're left with is we have to connect to A somehow and the only things that we can connect to it are these two endpoints um, so E or or D and and actually what we're going to do is connecting both of those so again you get this kind of equally bad solution again greedy strategies don't always give us the optimum solutions even if they seem good and one of the big problems with any like greedy traveling salesman problems so they, they tend to be worse than greedy strategies for some other things is that when you're building this up it seems pretty good but then you have to somehow get back to the beginning and it's that getting back to the beginning that's a really big challenge. Um, so you can think of like uh, the, it's, it's almost like a Hansel and Gretel problem that if Hansel and Gretel are following the breadcrumbs, they're taking another step and another step and another step, um, but they're not like gonna be able to get back to where they started. In fact, they end up being, I think, eaten by the, the evil person in the cottage. Um, yes, yeah, so it's kind of a dark, dark story. Um, but it's because they were greedy, I guess. Uh, I guess that's the moral of that story is that they used a greedy strategy. And so the last strategy to talk about is that we can take any, it's actually not even necessarily greedy, but any um, valid solution and then make it better. So the idea is that we start with something and then we ask, is there any way to make it better? And so this is one particular strategy of making it better is you basically take any two edges and you swap them with a different two edges along the cycle. I think if we swap A, B, and C, D, let's see what happens. So it's going to leave these two edges, the two fives, leave them as they are, but is going to replace this um, green and purple part, that, well, really the purple part, by going here. Then I follow this one backwards. Then I go here. And then I continue the rest um, so to follow along those same original green two edges. And so what do we have is that the original 
was 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 2 plus 2. So the green edges add up to 19. And the refined um, ends up being 5 plus 5 plus 2 plus 2 plus 4 is the optimum of 18 in this graph. And so what you, what you do with this kind of refinement is we, um, you consider any pair and then keep going until you can't make any more improvements. So why is it called a local refinement? Is because the idea is instead of totally starting over the problem, I'm gonna take the solution I have and turn it into maybe a slightly better solution and then turn that one into a slightly better solution and then turn that one into a slightly better solution until we can't go any farther. Um, so this still might not get us the optimal answer. In this case, for this graph, it gives the optimal answer, but that's not always going to be the case. But again, it's a way of, uh, it's, it's one of the practical techniques that people use. So a lot of things we've just talked about are a little bit um, into dangerous territory in terms of talking about algorithms, because a lot of them are not necessarily going to find the optimum, but find something pretty good. And the point is that for problems like TSP, where there is no optimum polynomial time solution, we have to sometimes take these as good as we can get it, um, kind of trying to do your best approaches because there's going to be no way to perfectly solve it quickly every time. And that kind of problem is where we're going to look at more and more in the coming units of uh, what kind of problems end up being this like hard to solve ones. And what we've just seen is that sometimes we can approximate them, sometimes we can restrict to certain kind of problem where it gets easier. Um, but in the worst case, we're not gonna be able to do anything perfectly for them, like vertex cover and TSP. And until that next time, I uh, wish you a pleasant day. Bye-bye.